Hello, fellow kids, and welcome back to What is Politics? In the first episode of this podcast, we talked about how politics is unique among practical disciplines and that most of the political terms and concepts that we use every day are empty words. Words that everyone uses without really knowing what they mean. Words like capitalism, socialism, left, right, government, ideology, democracy, even the word politics itself. And we looked at how this makes us easier to manipulate and turns politics into a game of competing identity groups, where people who agree on all sorts of issues are divided into red team versus blue team, instead of working together on common goals and against common enemies. In episode two, we defined politics as decision-making in groups, and we asked how we as ordinary people who don't have official decision-making power might be able to exercise our influence over the people who do have official decision-making power, whether it's our government representatives, our bosses at work, or our landlords at home. And we came to the conclusion that the way that you get someone to do what you want them to do is by exercising your bargaining power. But before we start looking at how we exercise and increase our bargaining power, we need to figure out what sorts of things we want to use our bargaining power for. And to do that, we need to understand what the political right and left are all about. There are no political words more misunderstood and abused than left and right. Since the 1964 publication of The Nature of Belief Systems in Mass Publics, until today, you have study after study showing that a large majority of people can't identify a far-left position from a far-right one. People routinely describe themselves as right-wingers while supporting mostly left-wing economic policies, or else they describe themselves as hardcore left-wingers while supporting extreme right-wing political institutions, while people who describe themselves as moderates or centrists typically hold a mishmash of extreme right and left-wing views. As a result of the confusion about left and right, more and more people think that these are obsolete terms. By the mid-1950s, you already had certain authors complaining about these terms being outdated. You can find a short piece online called Neither Left Nor Right by libertarian capitalist Leonard Reed from 1956, where he writes about how left and right end up being the same thing at the extremes, and he gives the example of Hitler's Nazi Germany on the extreme right and Stalin's Soviet Union on the extreme left, which resembled each other in important ways. Therefore, according to Reed, the real divide in politics is not left and right, but authoritarianism versus libertarianism, his preferred ideology. This idea that left and right converge at the extremes, sometimes called horseshoe theory, is very popular, but also very incorrect, as we'll see shortly. Because properly defined, left and right are totally incompatible opposites, just like left hand and right hand directions, or cold and hot, up and down, big and small, never the twain shall meet, at least not at the same time and the same place, as we'll see in a bit. In recent years, you have political parties all around the world, from Green Party candidates in Canada, to American Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang, to fascist parties in Italy, with almost the same exact slogan, neither left nor right, but forward. And every few years, you get people trying to replace left and right with supposedly more useful concepts like open versus closed, which is like making a super insulting new political spectrum with open, hip, and cool geniuses on one side and closed, stupid, foolish dum-dums on the other. And even though many people identify very strongly as being on the left or on the right or in the center or as being too independent-minded for such foolish worldly classifications, very few people know what these terms actually mean. You can read article after article or book after book discussing left and right and not find a definition of the terms anywhere. And when you do find a definition, more often than not, it's the wrong definition. And this absence of definitions and incorrect use of the terms is true even of books and articles written by PhD doctor professors specifically about left and right. So for one example, you can read The Great Debate. Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of Left and Right by Ph.D. Dr. Professor Yuval Levin. In 350 pages about left and right, he somehow forgets to define what left and right actually mean. Uh, it's like different directions or something? <laughs> or you can read Wars of Position, the Cultural Politics of Left and Right by political science Dr. Professor Timothy Brennan. So this book is about left and right in cultural politics. As I mentioned briefly in the second episode, cultural status is one of the main determinants of a person's level of decision-making, or political, power. So for example, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews had different rights in different European countries in the 16th and 17th centuries. 
Being a woman meant you couldn't own property until the 19th century in Europe and North America, and you couldn't vote until after World War I. Having black skin or white skin meant that you had different legal rights in the United States until the 1960s. As I'll be explaining shortly, the concepts of left and right are crucial to understanding which side is which in cultural battles where people with less rights are trying to get more rights. But you wouldn't know this from reading this Wars of Position book, where the author manages to fill 300 plus pages without defining the main concepts that he's supposedly writing about. He just expects you to feel what they mean. Blue team versus red team. Black hats versus white hats. Good guys versus bad guys. Another 300 page academic book about basically nothing. Then there's a 2014 article in the Atlantic Monthly called The Left-Right Political Spectrum is Bogus by Dr. Professor Kristen Sartwell. Sartwell throws up his hands and says that you just can't define left and right because they're ultimately meaningless terms. All the common definitions like the state versus the market, or equality versus liberty, or collectivism versus individualism, they can't possibly be right if you go over what and whom these terms have been used to describe over the years. Again, he points to Hitler and Stalin. How can they be so similar yet at opposite ends of the spectrum? Therefore, he says, it's time to throw these categories out the window entirely and replace them with a new political spectrum based on equality versus hierarchy, which is pretty hilarious, as you'll see in a few minutes. All this confusion and irritation with these terms begs the question, why do we even need left and right anymore? Don't we want people thinking for themselves instead of according to some prepackaged ideological scripts? You'll often hear politicians say things like, We need to abandon tired old ideas like left and right and just find solutions that work. And this resonates with a lot of people who want politicians to work together for the common good, instead of the red team versus blue team mentality of political parties who prioritize getting elected over finding solutions to our problems that work for everyone. But... The problem is that there's no such thing as a solution that works for everyone. You always have to ask, works for whom? Because even when something improves the lives of the vast majority of people, there are always some people who were better off when everyone else was worse off. Like imagine if you could set up a magical fairy dust healthcare system that would have all of the top technology, and you could choose whatever doctor you wanted, and there's a high number of doctors per person, and everyone is enrolled automatically, and it's absolutely free. And I don't mean free as in paid for by taxes. I mean free as in crazy Gumby Gold free. Like it's paid for by rubbing a magic genie lamp. The only caveat is that everyone has to use this same system. You can't buy private healthcare. Well, this would undoubtedly improve the lives and healthcare quality of 99.999% of the world's population. And it would also undoubtedly be the greatest healthcare system ever in the history of the world for 99.999% of the population. But there would be the other 0.0001% of the population a handful of super ultra-wealthy people who currently, whenever they scrape their knee, can afford to have Dr. Phil flown in by helicopter to come in and kiss their boo-boo. Well, those people wouldn't have exclusive access to Dr. Phil anymore, because everyone else would also have the same access to Dr. Phil as they do, which means that Dr. Phil might be out there kissing some poor person's boo-boo and not be available for their boo-boos every single time they want him. So even though this is the greatest healthcare system ever devised, this tiny group of people would be at a relative disadvantage. Also, this new system would wipe out existing healthcare insurance companies. They would become obsolete, so some shareholders would lose out, as would employees of these insurance companies. So even in the best, most fantastic imaginary drug-induced hallucination scenarios, solutions to problems don't just work. They work for some people, but not for others. And what the left-right political spectrum does, and why it's so important, is that it helps us identify who any given policy, or politician, or political party, or ideology works for, and who it works against. There's an idea that's very common, though a bit less so today in our increasingly polarized times, that left and right are just different ways of achieving the same basic goals. It's true that most people, whether we see ourselves as being on the left or on the right, do share many of the same goals. But left and right are not primarily about different means to attain similar ends. They are very much about opposing and incompatible ends, opposing and incompatible visions about what the ideal world should look like, and about who should get what and why, and who should be in charge and why, and who shouldn't be in charge and why not, who gets to make decisions and who has to put up with and follow those decisions. 
To understand left and right, first we need to understand that on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, there are all sorts of situations where people simply have opposing and incompatible interests. Tenants normally want to have an affordable rent, and landlords normally want to charge the highest possible rent. Employees usually prefer a job that's interesting and pays well, but employers generally just want you to work as much as possible for as little as possible, and they want to be able to control what you do as much as possible. Citizens want their governments to be as transparent and accountable as possible, but governments usually want to be able to do their work without people watching over their every move. Sometimes the interests of these parties align temporarily, and maybe you love your boss and your landlord, but at least some of your basic interests are always opposed. Like if your rent goes down, then you're better off, and your landlord is worse off, and vice versa. What the left-right political spectrum does is it helps us understand who's who in conflicts between people and groups of people who have these types of opposing interests. So what do left and right actually mean? A little earlier, I mentioned the article The Left-Right Political Spectrum is Bogus, where the author tells us that we should get rid of left and right and replace them with equality versus hierarchy. For this, I want to award the author of that article the Idiot Savant Prize for Politics, because that is exactly what left and right already mean. For the past 12,000 years or so, depending on which anthropologist you talk to, there have been societies where some people have had more power, more rights, and more wealth than others. And since that time, there have been those people who think that these inequalities are morally justified, necessary, and good, and there have been those people who think that these inequalities are morally unjustified, unnecessary, and bad. Those people who think that these inequalities are just or necessary are on the right, and those who think that they should be reduced or eliminated are on the left. How do we know that left and right mean equality versus hierarchy, instead of other popular definitions like the market versus the state, or the individual versus the collective, or big government versus small government? We know what left and right actually mean because of the circumstances that gave birth to left and right as political terms, and because of how these terms were used from that time up until the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States that mixed everything up and created the confusion about left and right that we're mired in today. The terms left and right enter our political vocabulary with the French Revolution, which kicks off in 1789. The King of France had lost much of his authority as a result of a succession of bungled crises, wars, and famines, and eventually delegates from all three of the traditional feudal era social orders, the nobility, the clergy, and the common people, gathered independently of the king in what they called the National Assembly to make decisions about the present and future of France. Two major orientations emerged from the various delegates, those who wanted to maintain the monarchy and the traditional social order as much as possible, and those who wanted to move away from the traditional social order towards liberal enlightenment principles. At first, moving away from the traditional order meant a bit more political and cultural equality, but then as events progressed, this meant more and more radical forms of equality, including economic equality. And because birds of a feather flock together, this split was reflected in the physical positioning of the delegates in the room. On the right side of the room, you had the pro-monarchy delegates, and on the left side of the room, you had the pro-revolution delegates. And voila, the political left and right are born. We'll talk a bit more in the future about the French Revolution and the history of the terms left and right to make it clear to all of you people who insist that left and right mean a bunch of other things besides hierarchy and equality, why those other definitions can't be right. But in this episode, I want to focus on why hierarchy and equality are such fundamental concepts when it comes to politics. So what do hierarchy and equality mean, and what do they have to do with politics? We all know what equality means, the condition of being the same. And because we're talking about politics, we're not talking about equality in terms of height or strength or ability or intelligence, like in some Harrison Bergeron story. We're talking about equality in terms of decision-making power. And remember from episode two, we talked about four categories of politics, meaning four main determinants of decision-making power, political institutions, economics, culture, and interpolity relations, or politics, economics, culture, and international for short. So when we talk about political equality, we're thinking about political institutions that give everyone an equal say, like democracy or direct democracy further to the left. We're thinking about equality of rights between different cultural groups. We're thinking about economic equality, because usually the more wealth that you have, the more decision-making power that you have, like the power to hire people and tell them what to do all day, or the power to hire lobbyists or give donations to influence political parties that make decisions for everyone, or the power to get people to give you things you want by throwing money at them. 
And we're thinking about equality between different polities. Polities meaning political units, like nation-states, or tribes, cities, provinces, etc. Meanwhile, hierarchy means inequality, but inequality ranked according to some value. So an apple and a banana and a watermelon are unequal, but they're just randomly unequal. There's no hierarchy. But if you start ranking your fruits according to which one has the most sugar, or which one is bigger, or which one you like more, then you end up with a hierarchy of fruits, ranked according to sweetness or size. Like fruits, humans have all sorts of differences, in terms of body type, personality, ability, geography, religion. But when it comes to politics, what we're interested in is hierarchies of decision-making power. Who gets to decide and who doesn't? Who has rights and who doesn't? Who gets to give orders and who has to obey orders? Who gets to do what they want and who has to do what someone else wants all day? So we're not interested in hierarchies of height or hierarchies of competence, as Dr. Professor Jordan Peterson likes to talk about, unless they have some relationship to inequality of decision-making power. Like if having white skin gives you more rights than having black skin, then that becomes political. If being better at math gives you more money than someone who isn't good at math, then that becomes political. And again, we're looking at the four categories or axes of politics. So we're looking at hierarchies in political institutions, culture, economics, and interpolity relations. Hierarchical political institutions are things like monarchies or dictatorships, the top-down command structure of the army, or the opt-out dictatorship of the owner in a capitalist workplace. Cultural hierarchies are when people of one cultural category, like a religion or gender or caste or race, have more rights than people from another cultural category. Economic hierarchy means when there are rich people and there are poor people, resulting in different levels of decision-making power. And we're also looking at hierarchy between polities, usually nations. So we're looking at situations of empire or colonialism, where the decision-making power of people in one nation is impeded or determined by people of a stronger nation. But it can also be power relationships between tribes, or else the hierarchy between a city and a state and a federal or national government. For practical examples of left-right dynamics in our everyday lives, we can look at those situations that I mentioned earlier, when there's an inherent conflict of interest between people in a hierarchical situation. So let's take the capitalist workplace. You have a political hierarchy, meaning a decision-making hierarchy, with owners on top. They have all the decision-making power, and they delegate some power down to management, who are in the middle, who use that power to control the workers, who are on the bottom. And each one of those general ranks in a decision-making hierarchy is called a class, which just means a category. But since we're talking about politics, we're talking about decision-making categories. The owner or the capitalist class is on top, the management class is in the middle, and the working class is on the bottom. And if we were talking about the army, we'd be looking at the officer class versus the enlisted class. When it comes to conflicts between workers and owners, the left-wing position is the one that flattens out or equalizes the hierarchy the most. In other words, the one that favors the workers, usually in the sense of giving more money or more power or more rights to workers, while the right-wing position is the one that favors the existing hierarchy. In other words, the owners gives more money or power or rights to owners and managers. Or, if we're talking about cultural hierarchies, like in the United States before the Civil Rights Act, when black people had less rights than white people, the left-wing position was that they should have equal rights, and the right-wing position was that discriminatory laws should be allowed to remain in force. In terms of economics, which means anything to do with resources and groups, if we look at healthcare in the United States in the year 2020, an entirely tax-funded universal healthcare plan, like what Bernie Sanders advocates, is a left-wing plan compared to the status quo in a number of ways. First of all, it eliminates private insurance, so that everyone has the exact same healthcare plan as a right, regardless of income. This eliminates one of the benefits of being on top of the wealth hierarchy, and that you couldn't buy better healthcare than everyone else has. It also flattens out decision-making hierarchies, taking away decision-making power from insurance companies and putting it in the hands of doctors and patients, and the government, which theoretically at least is supposed to represent the people. And it reduces wealth hierarchy in general, in that it forces wealthier people to pay more taxes into the system than poor people have to pay, thus reducing their overall pile of wealth. We can see left and right in the different responses to the coronavirus pandemic. 
As of late March 2020, when I'm recording this, we can see a lot of the governments rushing in to throw money at big business, banks, and landowners, while measures to help workers and unemployed people only cover narrow slivers of the people who are affected. Lots of people don't qualify for these measures, and to get help you have to deal with complicated means testing requirements, confusing paperwork, and other obstacles. Landlords get mortgages suspended, but tenants have to keep paying rent. Or else evictions get suspended, but tenants' debts keep accumulating, ensuring that they'll all just be evicted when the pandemic is over. And breaking. As I edit this, United States President Donald J. Trump just announced that he thinks it's worth it to let millions of people die, rather than halting the economy for a few months to slow the progression of the disease to manageable levels. Texas Lieutenant Governor Don Patrick quickly went on Fox News to tell Tucker Carlson that his, quote, heart was lifted, unquote, by the president's announcement. And he went on to joyfully explain to viewers that the grandparents of America will be happy to sacrifice themselves to help keep the economy going uninterrupted for their grandchildren. Meanwhile, Vanity Fair reports that the U.S. president refuses to use his legal power to order private companies to produce the medical supplies, like masks and ventilators, which his country desperately lacks, because the CEOs of various corporations told him that it would harm their profits. In future episodes, we'll look into how things like big businesses' organized lobbying efforts, combined with ideology, culture, social networks, and ordinary people's lack of organized lobbying efforts, leads to these sorts of results. But for now, what's relevant is that when you help the big guy instead of the little guy, like when you sacrifice millions of weak people so that the rich don't have to pay any taxes or lose any profits, that's right-wing politics. And when you help the little guy at the expense of the big guy, like by suspending rents and mortgages and sending out a universal food allowance that can be reclaimed from people who didn't need it at tax time, and by making banks and the wealthiest taxpayers absorb the brunt of it, that's left-wing politics. Now, some of you are listening to this thinking, what is this crap? I'm on the right because I support the little guy. I think renters deserve a break and that banks shouldn't be bailed out. And I hate dictatorship. It's those leftist communist governments that crush the little guy and that are the authoritarian dictatorships. It's that leftist Obama that bailed out the banks and let the homeowners go under and lose their homes. So to make sense of this, there are a few things to understand. First, you need to understand that you might like to think of yourself as being on the right, and you might be politically conservative, but if you support democracy over authoritarianism, you're not actually on the right, at least not when it comes to political institutions. You're on the left. Democracy is a form of political equality. Everyone gets an equal say. Equality is on the left. It's important to note here that while conservative and liberal are often used synonymously with right and left, that is just a mistake. Liberalism and conservatism are a mix of left-wing and right-wing ideas, which we'll look at in another episode. And Fox News might find it convenient to call Obama a leftist. But when you bail out banks while letting homeowners go under, and when most of your cabinet are Wall Street hacks, that's right-wing politics. Left-wing politics would be bailing out homeowners and then confiscating the banks. Another thing to understand, particularly for people who identify as being on the left, is that those authoritarian communist governments, like the Soviet Union or Cuba, they might be on the left when it comes to things like economic distribution or male-female equality, but they're actually on the right when it comes to political organization. So-called communist regimes are extremely hierarchical and therefore right-wing in terms of political organization. We'll look at communism, socialism, and communist countries in another episode, but one thing that causes confusion about left and right is that you can be on the right in one area, but on the left in another. Another very common example is someone who thinks that we need to be very strict about immigration, so right-wing on a cultural issue, immigration status is a culturally determined hierarchy between citizens and immigrants, and that same person also thinks that there should be more economic equality, and that rich people should pay higher taxes. So this person is right-wing on immigration, but left-wing on economics, even if they think of themselves as a big right-winger nationalist Trump fan. So it causes confusion that a lot of people are really attached to left and right-wing labels without really knowing what they mean. But another thing that causes confusion is that some people straight up lie about where they are on the spectrum, for cynical PR purposes. So given the way that Fox News has turned the word leftist into an insult, you'll never hear someone like Tucker Carlson admit that his critiques of the Republicans and Democrats on economic issues are frequently coming from the left, even though he probably knows enough to understand that this is the case. 
Or if you take Stalin, who was the dictator of the Soviet Union from the late 1920s until 1953. Back in Stalin's day, the meaning of left and right was much more clearly understood than it is today. And Stalin surely understood that his authoritarianism represented a dramatic shift to the right. But because his entire legitimacy depended on his status as the leader of the world's socialist movement, which was the global movement of the left, there's no way he would ever allow himself to be described that way. And in fact, Stalin is one of the big reasons that the terms left and right have become so mixed up today, as we'll see in another episode. Another thing that can sometimes be confusing is that since left and right are relative terms, like hot and cold or up and down, something that's considered a left-wing position today might be considered a right-wing position a hundred years later, or in a different place. So early on in the French Revolution, the delegates on the left of the National Assembly were pushing for things like a constitutional monarchy, with elections and equal representation for everyone regardless of their noble, clerical, or commoner status. And they advocated things like protection of private property, and for freedom to trade without government interference. But a hundred years later during the Third Republic, those were the positions of right-wing parties in France. Why? Because the left and right are relative, and by that time, you no longer had a monarchy, and the monarchist movement itself was dying out. And now you had socialist parties on the left, demanding economic equality, on top of the representational and civil rights equality which had already been achieved. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about hierarchy, because hierarchies are a fundamental part of politics in any large, complex society. Political hierarchies develop in social animals, like humans, for three main purposes, and you'll hear people on the right pointing to the first and sometimes second reasons, and people on the left focusing on the third reason. Number one is that political hierarchies increase efficiency, so that a group of people can act like a unit and accomplish tasks without everyone constantly arguing about what should be done and who should do it. Two familiar examples are in an army, or in a capitalist workplace like I described earlier. And the idea is that even though it's more fun to give orders than to take orders, everyone, even the people at the bottom taking the orders, are theoretically better off working together and accomplishing things as a unit instead of arguing over everything and accomplishing very little. Number two is that hierarchies reduce the amount of conflicts that people have by deciding in advance who wins and who loses in situations of potential conflict. And theoretically, even though people on the lower ranks have to give way to the needs and choices of those in higher ranks, the lower ranks still get more than they would have gotten if everyone had to fight about everything all the time. So when two chimpanzees see a pile of bananas, the higher-ranking chimpanzee takes what he wants and leaves some for the lower-ranking chimpanzee so that they don't have to fight and kill each other each time they see a pile of bananas. Similarly, when a fast food company rakes in a bunch of profits, the CEO gets zillions of dollars while the service employees get minimum wage and have trouble paying their bills. But theoretically, the service employees are still better off than they would be if they were just killing each other and fighting over who gets how much, instead of collaborating to generate more wealth for everyone. And number three, and this is foundational to the left, is that hierarchies allow some people to hog power, wealth, and freedom at the expense of other people. So even when a particular hierarchy is totally detrimental to society, even if there are more efficient and more egalitarian ways of organizing things, it is usually still beneficial to the people at the top of a hierarchy to maintain that hierarchy, so they'll try to keep it going as much as possible, so they can keep hogging as much power, rights, and wealth for themselves as they can get away with. So maybe a McDonald's worker would make a lot more money if McDonald's were a worker-owned and controlled cooperative. And maybe the worker would also have more decision-making power, more job security, and more job satisfaction. And maybe the company would offer cheaper prices to consumers, as is usually the case with cooperatives. And maybe they would just make choices that respect the environment and local communities more than they do now. And maybe it would be just so much better for society as a whole if corporations were all cooperatives. But, if that happened, shareholders and directors wouldn't be swimming in buckets of profit and power, so they will never, ever let that happen. Now, because hierarchies always put some people at a disadvantage, hierarchies are always at risk of being challenged. For this reason, hierarchies always come with some sort of justification. Like, even if it's a 100% number 3 exploitation hierarchy like slavery, there's always some kind of reasoning for it. An efficiency justification, a necessity justification, a religious justification, a moral justification, a natural scientific justification, or a combination of all these. And sometimes, it's just pretending that there is no hierarchy at all. 
Like in a couple of episodes, when we look at the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, we'll see how both sides would offer all sorts of justifications for their political or economic hierarchies. But sometimes they would also argue that there was no real fixed hierarchy. Sure, you have rich bosses and poor workers, but any poor person with talent and gumption could become a zillionaire business owner in the United States, just like John Rockefeller did. And sure, you have dirt poor peasants and comfortable Communist Party bureaucrats with summer dachas. But any dirt poor peasant with talent could rise to the top of the Soviet Union, like comrade Nikita Khrushchev did. Two classless societies fighting for world supremacy. Marx's wet dream. So in left-right political debates, you'll see people who are on the right on any given issue, even if they're pretending to be on the left, making practical and moral justifications for a particular hierarchy, or pretending that it doesn't exist. And people on the left on any given issue, regardless of what they call themselves, are reminding us that a particular hierarchy does exist, and arguing that it's unjustified, and making moral and practical arguments for why things should be more equal. For example, in a pure capitalist workplace, there is a hierarchy of power, rights, wealth, and working conditions based on bargaining power. Normally the boss has overwhelming bargaining power because he owns the means of production, and therefore he has dictatorship authority, and the worker's only option if he doesn't like something is to give up his salary and leave. And if a worker produces $10,000 a month in value, if he has a lot of bargaining power, maybe he can keep seven or 8000 of that a month. But if he has low bargaining power, he only gets to keep $1,000 a month, or even less. And high bargaining power workers don't just get more of a share of the value that they produced, but they also get better working conditions, while very low bargaining power workers have to harm their bodies and pee in diapers like at Amazon warehouses or Purdue chicken processing plants, or in third world sweatshops, and they get to die from lack of health care. Is this fair? Is it necessary? Is it the best way of organizing economic production? The right-wing position will be that yes, it is fair. The boss puts in the risk and the work and the investment to start up the workplace, so he morally has earned the right to have the authority and the surplus over wages paid. And yes, it's necessary, because if there's no potential to earn more profit, then no one would take those risks or start any businesses at all. And if workers want more pay, then it's their responsibility to increase their bargaining power by making themselves more useful to employers, by getting more education and skills, or else it's their responsibility to start their own businesses and become business owners themselves. Also, it's fair because everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. There are no laws in pure capitalism to prohibit a poor person or a black person or a woman or a Jew from becoming an owner or getting an education, and therefore it's fair and it's not really a hierarchy in the first place. People are choosing to be workers instead of owners because that's what they prefer. And the left-wing position would be, no, it's not fair. Why should some people spend their entire lives taking orders from other people just because the owner inherited the money that he started his business with from his dad, or because he inherited the whole business from his dad? And why should a person have 90% of the value of their work sucked away just because they're weak and the other person is strong? And just because there are no laws preventing someone from being an owner doesn't mean that there aren't a million other obstacles that make it functionally impossible for most people. And why should people who are good at business deserve so much wealth and power, while people who aren't good at business deserve to die from lack of health care? And furthermore, it's not necessary. It's just legalized hogging, where people who have more wealth gain more wealth. There are other successful ways of organizing workplaces, like cooperatives where the workers are the owners and get to have democracy at work instead of dictatorship, or like socialism where the whole community that's affected by an enterprise from workers to the local neighborhood to the consumers gets to have a say. And you can also have an intermediate centrist position, which is a compromise between the left and right positions. So in this case, a centrist position would be to keep capitalist power relations, but you create laws to give low bargaining power workers a little more bargaining power like minimum wage laws or overtime pay laws, or laws that say that you have to give workers bathroom breaks. And remember, left and right are relative to whatever you're comparing to, like if you're comparing to the status quo or relative to what your question is, in this case the question of, is capitalism fair? Now justified or not, people who support existing hierarchies, meaning people on the right, particularly those people who benefit from those hierarchies, don't usually like it when people are running around asking questions about whether the hierarchies that they benefit from are legitimate or not. They usually want you to take it for granted that they're legitimate, that these hierarchies are not only justified and necessary, but that they're part of nature. 
And this is why the left-right political spectrum is inherently a left-wing concept. By making you look at politics in terms of hierarchy versus equality, it implicitly invites you to notice the existence of hierarchies, and the fact that some people think that these hierarchies are not legitimate or justified. That's why the right has always been uncomfortable with the left-right political spectrum, from the very beginning of the use of those terms in the National Assembly in France, right up until the Cold War, when the right changed the meaning of those terms to mean market versus state, or collective versus individual, or liberty versus equality, concepts which frame politics in right-wing terms, as we'll see in a future episode. So if we look at the book that I mentioned earlier, by self-identified conservative author Yuval Levin, The Great Debate, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of Left and Right. Although he doesn't define left and right, you can infer that he thinks that left and right are about one's attitude towards change, not about hierarchy versus equality. Even though almost every quote that he cites from Edmund Burke is about justifying hierarchy, and almost every quote that he cites from Thomas Paine is about the morality of equality, according to Levin, what makes someone a right-winger is that they want slow, cautious evolutionary change, like Edmund Burke did, while what makes someone a left-winger is that they want fast, thoughtless revolutionary change that throws away the wisdom of the ages. Compare this to socialist writer Cory Robin, author of The Reactionary Mind, a book about the nature of right-wing thought. Robin doesn't define left and right either, but his book takes for granted that the left seeks equality, and the main thesis of his book is that the right's primary MO is inventing new justifications for hierarchy and new ways to preserve hierarchy in reaction to equalizing challenges from the left. And like you, when I first asserted that left and right refer to equality versus hierarchy, if you're someone who's really into politics, and hierarchy versus equality made immediate sense to you, you're probably someone whose politics are generally on the left. And if you're really into politics and you think that hierarchy versus equality is irrelevant to politics, or it's archaic, or childishly oversimplified, or that it just doesn't speak to you, then your politics probably lean right, even if you see yourself as a liberal or a centrist. And that's because you're not thinking about hierarchies or inequalities. You're taking hierarchies for granted. And instead, you're thinking about things like collectivism versus individualism and liberty. Or you're thinking about common sense, win-win solutions to our problems that work for everyone. In our democratic age, people tend to think of equality as a sort of moral baseline, and a hierarchy needs an excuse or a justification. So you'll tend to see more moral arguments for equality and more efficiency arguments for hierarchy. But just because something is more equal doesn't necessarily mean that it's any good, even morally. There's a book by philosopher Dr. Professor Harry Frankfurt called On Equality, where he argues that no one should care about economic inequality, and that we shouldn't worry about the fact that some people have enormous, unimaginable mountains of wealth. We should only focus on whether the poorest have enough. Now this is a really naive third grade argument, for reasons that I discussed briefly in a short video that you can find on the What is Politics YouTube channel called Why Inequality Matters, Even When the Poorest Have Enough. But Dr. Frankfurt's book does have one useful passage where he clearly illustrates how equality can sometimes be a bad thing. He says, imagine if you have eight people with a potentially fatal disease and there are only seven doses of the cure. If you don't get a full dose, the cure doesn't work. So if you divide the doses equally, everyone dies. So even if sharing equally might be your moral ideal, sometimes there just isn't enough to go around if you want a functioning society, and you have to figure something else out. Maybe you'll draw straws at random, or you'll have to establish some kind of hierarchy of importance. Maybe the oldest person or sickest person should die so the rest can live. Furthermore, while human beings can and have organized in very egalitarian societies, and in the future we'll take a look at perfectly functional hunter-gatherer societies, where men and women are equal, and there are no fixed authority positions in society at all. Any large organization of people doing complex coordinated tasks needs some kind of structure or organization, and it's really difficult to organize anything complex without some kind of hierarchy. Like if you've ever worked at a badly organized health food co-op, or an anarchist bookstore, you've experienced what it's like to have an egalitarian organization with no structure. It sucks. People droning on about nothing at endless meetings, endless arguments about every minute issue. It kind of feels like a human body with five arms and no head and no feet. The more people that are involved, the more it sucks. Organizations need structure. They need delegation of duties and division of labor. For larger organizations, usually need some kind of hierarchy. But hierarchies can be more authoritarian, or they can be more democratic. In other words, they can be more right-wing or more left-wing. 
On the right you have your regular autocratic or top-down hierarchies, where authority flows from the top to the bottom. But on the left, you have democratic bottom-up hierarchies, where all members have an equal say in choosing who gets to have temporary authority. In terms of workplaces, an example of a democratic hierarchy is a cooperative, where workers elect their managers and their CEO, and they can even be involved in decisions about how much people get paid. You can look up the Mondragon Cooperative, which runs supermarkets, gas stations, banks, and all sorts of other businesses in Europe, for an example of a large, successful cooperative. And this political equality translates into economic equality. Mondragon enterprises have an average of 5 to 1 pay ratio between the top executive position and the lowest wage worker, compared to an average 278 to 1 pay ratio between CEOs and median workers in American corporations. A cooperative is to an ordinary corporation as a representative democracy is to a dictatorship. Things might look the same if you're just visiting and walking around, but they're very different if you live and work there. Okay, so that's enough new information for now. Since this podcast is basically a political literacy course, we'll be building on these concepts in every episode. For now, keep everything you've learned in mind as you go about your day in your corona bunker, or as you encounter political media, and as you navigate through the various hierarchies in your life. And in this pandemic, that'll probably be your landlord, your government, and your employer if you still have one. Hopefully the world will make a little bit more sense than it did before you listen to this. If so, please share this podcast and rate and review it on iTunes and subscribe on Patreon so I can keep it going. If you have any questions, comments, or criticisms about anything, please send them to worldwidescroats at gmail.com and I'll make special response episodes to address them or else I'll address them in future episodes. Before we go today, I want to leave you with a quote that captures some of the spirit of left and right in today's politics. In Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's endorsement video of Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign, she talked about when she used to work as a waitress, and says, quote, I had been working 12-hour days. I didn't have health insurance. I was being paid less than a living wage, and I didn't think that I deserved any of those things. I thought that's just how life was, unquote. That's the right-wing view of the world. There are these big hierarchies of wealth, hierarchies of power, hierarchies of access to important resources like healthcare, and that's just how the world works. If you're at the bottom of those hierarchies, it's because that's where you deserve to be. You're not working hard enough, or you didn't go out and get the type of skills that one needs to be successful, or you didn't inherit enough money because your parents were irresponsible. And a right-wing thinker would go further. These hierarchies aren't just how the world works, they're good. They incentivize people to make the right choices, which benefit themselves and society as a whole. And these hierarchies are necessary for society to function. And the only way to avoid them would be a massive government tyranny, which is an even worse hierarchy. AOC continues, quote, It wasn't until I heard of a man by the name of Bernie Sanders that I began to question and assert and recognize my inherent value as a human being that deserves health care, housing, and a living wage. Unquote. And that's the left-wing view of the world. Every person inherently deserves the benefit of what society has to offer. And for that to happen, people need to fight the established hierarchies of the day, political, economic, cultural, and international, like big corporations who dominate the government, or like racism in the criminal justice system. And these hierarchies are not only unfair and immoral, but they're unnecessary and counterproductive. And now you understand left and right. You're welcome. Until next time, see ya! (laughs) 